Recording. Welcome and thank you for joining. So from now it's recording. Hello, uh, Christophe. Welcome to Business Model with Public. And Buenas we tardes, have... Estefania. Buenas tardes. I'm so pleased that you are here. That's very special meetup for me. So whenever you want, you can start presenting. Yes. Uh... Thank you for putting this together, Estefania. I've already paid my respects uh, before we started this um, because Estefania and I, we go back uh, some five years or so. Uh, and uh, I really like the work that Estefania is doing with, with the meetups, with bringing you know, together people who eventually may start companies or start projects together. I think that's extremely valuable. And it's really one of the things that makes the startup world go round. You know, that is unique to the startup world. Uh, we sometimes forget that, you know, like when you are self-employed or in the startup world, you get used to, you know, free events like this one happening all the time or people being helpful like Estefania. But, you know, a, a part of my time, I'm also helping large organizations to become more entrepreneurial. And in that world, it's still a sensation yeah, to have such things happening. Uh, yeah, colleagues helping each other out, internal meetups just for people who are interested, people giving an extra hour after you know, the workday or on the weekends to uh, do more than what's, what's necessary or what they're paid for. That is still exclusive, pretty much exclusive to the startup world. Yeah? And, and of course, it's one of the main drivers. It's what makes the startup world faster and more effective, arguably. Yeah? This constant exchange between people who have a certain experience or access to resources and you know giving them away for free to people who are looking for such information and resources and that is also one of the reasons or maybe the single most important reason why i am here uh, uh, tonight when estefania asked me to you know like put out some content that is like you know on a fundamental level helpful to people who are thinking about um starting to work the startup way or like, you know, beginning a project, you know, I, I pulled out this presentation here, which is called how to find great startup ideas and avoid the stupid ones, because this topic has been accompanying me for a long time. Now, like I have the firm opinion that founding a startup is not worth it just for the sake of founding a startup. You know, like sometimes you get the get the notion from the media, you know, from shows like Höhle der Löwen, Shark Tank, etc., that uh, that startup is like you do that for the sake of founding a startup. Yeah, because I don't know, it's fun, it's cool, it's like a lifestyle thing, but it it definitely isn't. It's it's something that needs to be handled with care and and something that is extremely intense, something that demands a lot of commitment, and that why it that's why it's it's really important to set out on the right idea, on an idea that can actually get you somewhere, that can create a value for you and others, that is a better alternative to your other options that you have in life. Because let's face it, all people that, or most people that, that get into the startup business, you know, have all options. You know, normally, most of us like have a, have a university degree, like we all have choices to go the you know, corporate way or to, uh, you know, join public administration or whatever and, and you know, get, uh, get ahead safely. That's what our parents want anyway, right? And to make the decision to not do that is brave. Only a small, small, small minority of people take that decision. I think currently in Germany, it's under 4% of people who either get self-employed or start their own company. So, you know, you being here in this, uh, you know, chat room, already makes you part of a very, very small minority. And it's important, according to me, that you use this opportunity and use this drive and commitment to create something meaningful. And my role it is to keep you from starting something unmeaningful. That is something that I'm, I'm also proposing in, in the meetup that I'm doing on a monthly basis. We'll, I'll, I'll give you uh, more about that later, but now let's delve in. How to find great startup ideas and avoid the stupid ones. That is already a controversial title, if you will, because uh, it uh, implicitly says that there is such a thing as a stupid startup idea. And that alone is already controversial because startup propaganda out there, you know, the stuff that you read in blogs, etc., often says that there is no stupid ideas. If you are passionate enough, if you are persistent enough, if you are smart enough, etc., you can basically turn any idea into a success. Yeah? That is 
that is you know part of the startup folklore you know like all these you know um uh, slogans like you know like uh a problem is only unsolvable until somebody solves it. That sort of stuff. You know what I mean, right? And my, however, my experience after 25 years is that there is a long list of stupid startup ideas and stupid in the sense of being not worth doing, not creating enough value, uh, bringing you and your idealism and your resources down, uh, you know, leading you directly into a burnout that's not worth it. And what we all, I guess, agree that it's not, it's no disgrace to fail, but if you fail, you should at least fail at a thing that's worth doing. That's one of my suggestions, you know, that I'm, I'm bringing into this antagonism between good startup ideas and stupid ideas. And I want you to alert you to the fact that there are stupid ideas. I want obviously to keep you, everyone in this room from starting a, a stupid idea and uh, give you the tools or like the, the underlying thoughts behind identifying the one or the other, right? So why am I doing this? Um, uh, let me, I'm doing this because I myself started like many of you did 25 years ago, that's me, uh, as someone who really had no clue what a startup was and who had only very limited ideas of venture capital and financing, etc. This is me uh, in 1997, when basically, I guess everyone in this room was already, was still a kid, uh, you know, like um, eating school uh, lunches and, and, you know, clinging to to their parents' advice, you know, like wanting to become astronauts or uh I mean, recently I read that more young people again want to become public servants. So maybe you know it was that time. This is me um, at the final day of our Latin class at the Free University of Berlin. Uh, the only degree that I have, the only uh, university degree is a degree in ancient history, Greeks and Romans. Uh, that's the only thing that I've ever properly studied that I have a degree in. And arguably you cannot be farther away from the startup scene than with having a degree in ancient history. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm telling you that because uh, there, there is hope. You know, like if you have a similar background, if you have a background in, I don't know, Germanistic or uh, cultural sciences or theater science or whatever there is out there, it doesn't mean that you know the startup career is hopeless for you or that you will never make it. No, I made it and so can you arguably. So uh, on this picture, we were having a Roman feast. Yeah? Like we were cooking after the cookbook of Lucullus, the, the Roman, like the first Roman super chef, you know, five-star chef who wrote down everything that, that you know, fine dining meant uh, in, in Roman times. So we were drinking mulsum, we were, which is the spiced wine that the Romans drank. And we cooked chicken uh, a la Roman empires, if you will. That's how it all started out for me, very far away from, you know, where I am now and way before, if you will, the startup scene as such started, began. In the time since, a lot happened. I'm not going to give you the whole breakdown. You can always check that on LinkedIn if you're interested or, you know, ping me uh, on, on LinkedIn, anything you like. But a few things that, that outline what my position or what my thoughts on startups are. Uh, in 2015, I uh, wrote uh, an ebook that's called Das Richtige Gründen, um, it's in German. It uh, means in, in, like in English, it, 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 it says uh, founding the right thing. You know, and this, this thing I wrote six years ago, and you can already see how this train of thought about founding the right thing, which implicitly means that there is also a wrong thing, right? This is a thought that I've been having for, for a long time. Also, because, you know, like during my... Uh, uh, like the, the the times that I founded startups, particularly also during the time that I ran my own accelerator program, I met so many ideas. I saw so many pitches. I saw patterns. I, I found things that went wrong or that didn't work again and again and again. And that's where my notion comes from, you know, that there's good things to start and but also bad things to start. Um, until last year, I produced and hosted and, you know, published a podcast that you are all invited to check. It's on all platforms. It's called Angels of Deutschland. It's also in German. And it's about every aspect uh, of being, becoming a business angel, but also for founders, how to work with business angels, how to get money from business angels, how to establish a workflow uh, with business angels. Angelsofdeutschland.de. Um, 
be my guest. It's all there for free. Also, the ebook is next, almost free. I think it's one ninety nine or so. Uh, so th that's like you know part of the way how I try to share everything I know, and I think that that I think it's useful with with a larger public. I'm also an investor. I'm a, I'm a business angel. You know, like this podcast is made after my own experiences uh, as a as a business angel and three startups that I've invested in, so that you get an idea what you know what I'm interested in, uh, what I think are good ideas. These are three startups that I have invested in and that I'm a shareholder of. Zenyovo is a platform that uh, remodels old people's homes, uh, old people who like are mobility impaired, for example, and with one click, they manage all the you know rebuilding of bathrooms, the accounting with health insurances, et cetera. Move a car is a company that's about vehicle transfers for large fleets, for rental companies, for example, or for large corporate fleets. So it's also like an enabler in the background, if you will. And uh, iCombine is a company that um, builds an HR software that makes it easier to assemble task forces, yeah, like specialized teams within a large organization for new projects coming up. So you can see that I'm very much into, I'm, I'm not in, very much into B2C. Yeah? I'm not very much into e-commerce, that sort of stuff, because I think that it's number one, two, expensive, yeah. like customer acquisition in the field of B2C is just very expensive because you need so many customers. While in B2B, you can already start making sense with a handful of customers. That's one of the things that I learned over the years. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit on the uh, utilitarian side of things when it comes to startups. I believe that startups need to solve uh, repetitive problems that, um, you know, are imp important on, an, on a, if you will, indust industrial or societal level. Um, even though, of course, you know, also a, a startup that's about luxury handbags will make money. You know, it's, it's just doubtful how big the contribution to the overall industrial, you know, progress in a country will be with them. So that's, that's all I want to tell you about me. Everything else, connect with me in LinkedIn if you're interested. There's, there's more stuff to see. All right. Let's get started with the idea of great ideas versus stupid ideas. Because, you know, accepting this, Honestly, it's a hypothesis of mine, you know, like this is debated in the industry. Are, is there anything like a stupid idea? Are there ideas that are inherently better than others? I say yes, others say no. Yeah? So I'm, I'm going to be honest about this just because I'm saying that there, this antagonism exists. It's not necessarily true, like most things in life, right? So what, what's, what's a great idea? In my view, a great idea is a, an idea that's desirable from customers, but also on a societal level, that's feasible, it can be done, uh, and that's viable, it can be maintained on an economic level. And plus, there is a fit with founders. Uh, this, this is really, uh, really important. Huh? So I'm, I'm, I'm very much a fan of people who find their ideas based on a problem. I'm skeptical about like the business or like the, the company uh, like the venture building approach that says, well, you know, can you can basically attach any sort of the idea to any sort of talented person and they will kind of turn that into success if given the right resources. I've seen that go wrong a lot of time. I, a lot of times I still believe that the combination of founders who are really knowledgeable about a specific problem in a specific environment uh, and, and find out whether that's also a good business opportunity um, and whether enough people really want it without having to force it on them, you know, that still is like the ideal ground to breed um, a, a good idea. What is a stupid idea? Well, it's one that's fancy uh, and, and wishful uh, and, uh, hold on, fancy, wishful, ignorant, meaning, you know, like without deeper knowledge of, of the subject, and you heard about it on Instagram. Yeah? You can already see that I'm a little bit of a conservative on this one because these days, of course, a lot of ideas spring up on Instagram, uh, you know, like uh, the, the coaching, nutrition, uh, you know, well-being, looking good, uh, boom, that is heavily depending on, uh, on, on visual media, on uh, like influencer marketing, etc. And again, it has been proven again and again that you can make money with this. I still think it's hard because in order to make money with this, you first need to invest a lot because you need to buy people's attention. But when I'm saying, well, you know, you want to found something great, it also means, you know, like something great will pull you also through the bad times of your startup. And that is more likely if you're after something where you're convinced that this will deliver an impact, not only on your bank account, 
but also you know on a, in a larger sense to uh, to the society if you will or like efficiency in a certain industry or it will create um, interesting careers whatever it is yeah so that is really on the basic level my distinction between great and stupid stupid is fancy wishful ignorant and i heard about it uh, on insta what does this in particular mean because on this level you know in in this uh, like on this level of generality, this is not really helping uh, much. Yeah? Let's start with stupid. And my definition of stupid ideas is based on the idea that there is something like toxic industries, industries that make it especially hard to be successful. And these industries are often heavily regulated. These are the you know building blocks of toxic industries, yeah? like a heavy regulation, tax or politics driven uh, like layout of, of, of the industry or of the you know, problem area. An unhealthy money, money flow, uh, unhealthy money flow, for example, means that a very small part of the industry is making a disproportionate amount of money. Like the best market for an entrepreneur is many people can be potential customers because many people make money in a certain market. But some industries don't work like this. Um, and, and I will explain to you right away which ones. Um, in some markets, only very few people make all the money and everyone else makes hardly any money. That is a toxic market, according to my definition. Markets in which passion triumphs over business size, uh, business sense, that is uh, also defi uh, defines a, a toxic industry. And markets in which there is no problem pressure, aka no pressure to change, now where the status quo is really profitable, very conservative, because people are just not feeling any pain. And examples for these um, uh, industries are, for example, music. Music, classically, is uh, an industry in which several of these uh, critical points hit. One is traditionally that music in music, founders often have more passion than business, business sense. Most founders who I've ever met who started a business in music, by the way, also in arts, do that not because they see a fantastic business opportunity, but because they're musicians or artists, because they're passionate about music and arts. And you know, here again, we have one of these interesting contradictions because other people say that you cannot have enough passion that it will be passion that pulls you through that you know makes you overcome all the all the hurdles so that you know anyone who dives into these segments and is purely driven by passion and not deterred by the fact that third point in music and arts there's also an unhealthy money flow you know 5% of artists make really make 95% of the money and everyone else is barely scraping by that is also a really unhealthy environment for an entrepreneur and some people will say, well, it's especially because the market is so tough, that's why it's important to, to be so pa be passionate. Yeah? But the truth is, if you put passion over business sense in such difficult markets, you're highly likely to burn everything you have and not get any um, success in return. So it's bad news because I, you know, me, like everyone else, I love music and arts. I'm a musician myself, but there's a reason why. I'm always saying that the only moment that I'm starting a music startup will be after I've basically got everything covered, after I have so much money that I don't care anymore about success or no success. Music and arts is something, sadly, that you can still, in my view, only run if, like in the role of a mecenas of a philanthropist. If you still try, you need to be aware of these points. Other toxic industries, unfortunately, public education. Again, you have an unhealthy money flow. Because in public education, 99% of the money comes from one source, which is, which is the state, yeah, the tax. Uh, that means that, third, second point, much of this is tax and politics driven, which you can't influence as an entrepreneur. You need to be in a space where you can at least partly influence your environment. If you're totally dependent on an environment that you cannot influence because it's politics driven, you are quite fucked, as, as many have realized before. Um, and, uh, you know, have regulation, uh, regulation, tax, politics driven, unhealthy money flow. That's all there in public education. That's why in 2021, we still learn in schools the way that we did in 1921, essentially. Yeah? That, that is not a coincidence. Health, unfortunately, same thing. Uh, tax and politics driven, heavy, the heaviest regulation of them all. And again, the unhealthy money flow, because so much of it comes from a highly politicized organization, the health insurance. Mm -hmm. um, construction, 
that's the point, you know, like particularly where, where like no problem pressure or like not enough drive for change uh, is, is one of the biggest problems. I've known a lot of um, founders who have tried to build something in you know, construction and architecture and they had brilliant ideas and they found obvious problems and still didn't, couldn't get any traction because all the books are full. Uh, all the participants, all the architects, all the construction companies, they have business until 2027 or something yeah there's this shortage of of skilled labor as well it's really so hard yeah so this is if you take it all in yeah stupid stupid is a bit of a cruel world but but if you try to found something in toxic industries you need to be aware that you're much more likely to fail than in industries that have less you know fewer of these criteria and that allow you to be more self-determined as an entrepreneur. And again, it's sad, you know, like the, the list of industries that you see here is precisely the list of industries that we're all getting mad about because they're still so undigitized and, you know, like uh, not working with technology that we have, but the reasons for that are really of this fundamental nature. Another piece of bad news, sustainability, which is a topic that many of you probably are working on now, may be one of these toxic, the toxic industries. You know, it's still pretty fresh. I'm not saying it is already, like the jury is still out on that, but sustainability, the fight against CO2, the fight against plastic so the, uh, pollution, et cetera, you know, has many of these criteria. We need to be fair and state that in order to deal with it, yeah? Because the sustainability market is often heavily regulated because you know, plastic materials, manufacturing processes, toxic, ingredients, they're all really heavily regulated and doing something about it means that you need to confront this regulation. It is definitely tax and politics driven. Yeah, uh, you can, as, as you know, like energy prices are regulated by the state, not by supply and demand. Um, there's definitely unhealthy money flow in many of these industries. There's a few heavyweights uh, that, that basically determine the policy in these industries and that you somehow need to find a way to deal with. And again, you have a lot of passion over business sense. I meet still too many founders who start something in the sustainability field because they are angry and passionate about the state that the world is in. And they think that being angry and passionate is enough to start a business in this field, but it isn't. You have to be business-minded. You have to tackle the sustainability segment with the same sense that you're tackling if you will, any e-commerce shop. It, it, it has to work. It has to work on the number space. It has to pay your bills. It has to, uh, to have the opportunity to grow and you know, be economically sustainable, right? In consequence, yeah, you have to acknowledge, especially when you look at these industries or these problems like health, like, like education that have been around for such a, such a long time and still haven't seen a lot of digital uh, evolution, if you will, you have to acknowledge that most things have already been tried you know, for, for a long time. And I know that probably better than most of you because you saw that I, like my career started some 25 years ago in 1997 or so. And I've seen, and that's one of the patterns that I've recognized over this time. Uh, I've seen a lot of ideas in a lot of segments come and go um, because the technology that's underlying uh, everything, which is, IP, TCP, IP, yeah, and, and hyperlinks, et cetera, like the, the internet, the exchange of data, this technology has more or less been mature for 20 years. And, you know, there was maybe an additional push in like that enabled new ideas when smartphones came to the market, but under, you know, the underlying technology of exchanging data and working with data has been around for a long time. And everything that hasn't been built in 20 years, well, there's probably good reasons why it, why it hasn't worked, you know? So, I give you a few ideas that have been tried again and again and that have failed again and again as examples of what you please don't try for the thousandth time. These are ideas that I still see in my meetup where people simply don't know that this has been failing for 20 years, where people are still putting money in and you know passion in. Please don't do that because these ideas suck massively. Finding sports and activity pals. I think I saw this idea as a startup for the first time in 1999. Local peer-to-peer -to -peer tour guides. Um, uh, the, the founder of um, uh, Get Your Guide always says that they started as a, as peer-to-peer -to -peer tour guides, and 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 only when they made the switch to you know being like the collection point uh, for for professional tour guides, that's when they started. But it took them a long time until they left this idea behind. Yeah, it's such an awful idea. It's being tried ever again and again. Um, 
curated nightlife options. Also around for 20 years, never worked, always failed. Peer-to-peer -peer cooking. That is a new classic. Uh, arguably, it's it's you know it, it has also been tried for 15, 20 years, not working. Uh, and you know after what I said about musicians, uh, you know musicians, creative art lovers, platforms, you can do that as a hobby, but there's no way to turn that into into a feasible model. And lastly, you know, in the field of sustainability, I'm seeing a lot of people now who are working on ways to reduce or measure individual CO2 footprints because they believe that there's millions of people out there who are dying to know if they're living sustainably. You know, I mean, the topic is quite new and still there's 300 startups having tried this and having failed at this because there's no business model. So, you know, the list of these, these duds uh, is, 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 is still growing but some of these duds are really 20 years old. So think three times, uh, talk to people who have tried this before and failed before you started again. The difficulty with that is that many of these things have failed so comprehensible, uh, comprehensibly that, that you don't even find traces anymore. That's why I'm saying, you know, if you can't find your idea after Googling it, there's a 98% chance that you have detected a grave not a gem, yeah? Like I still meet these founders who say, hey, I've Googled for peer-to-peer -peer cooking and there is nothing like that. So that means that I'm really, really innovative. And I'm saying, no, you're just the thousands person who is starting to try something that's inevitably going to die. Yeah? So that is important to understand. So instead of following with these, following up with these stupid ideas, I'm rather like, I'm suggesting let's rather go with great ideas because we simply have no time to fail. Yeah? If you have to fail again, do it because something is worth failing for, um, but but it's still better to be successful at uh, what you're doing and you know, creating creating value. That's what it's all about. Great ideas are still ideas that address something that's boring and repetitive. And there's still so many processes out there in, you know, like in industries, but also in our everyday life that are boring and repetitive. I'm now starting for the, I don't know how many is time to uh, do my, um, to apply for my, my Personalausweis, my ID card is running out. I still have eight months and living in Berlin, I know that I better start now. <laughs> You know, like in eight months, I might, might maybe get it done. So, but there you have like a total classic, like public administration is still, so boring that repetitive tasks like you know prolonging your, your idea cards cannot be solved uh, uh, reasonably. And you know, GovTech, as people name it, is also one of these toxic industries. But at least it it serves credible problems that are visibly not yet solved. You know, and those are still the interesting one that's, uh, ones that you want to go after. Um, great ideas are driven by non-obvious insights. They're nerdy. Yeah, they, they require you to be good at something or know something about stuff that others don't know about. Starting really small uh, and specific is what you, what you really want to do. Yeah, no niche arguably is too small. If within an interesting industry, you can find a niche that only has 500 participants and you can serve these 500 participants or like members really, really well, then that's where you want to start. That's what you want to go for. Everything else, as I said, you know, like e-commerce needs to aim basically for millions of users from day one. And that is possible, but only if you have funding, massive funding from the very start. And that's something that most of us don't have. Aim at non-obvious target groups. Still in my meetup, I'm seeing so many people who are targeting like, you know, you and me, people between 25 and 35, fluent in several languages, swimming in money, living in Prenzlauer Berg, taking their Latte Macchiato at Rosenthaler Platz. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding you, right? These ideas are still massively around. Like people serve a target group that number one doesn't exist. If it exists, everybody is targeting, targeting it. There is no progress in this. It's way too uh, costly to acquire this target group. On the other hand, there's large tracts of people who are not directly addressed, you know, older people. Few people know that actually like in the, in the gaming sector, like the most, the most lucrative target group in casual gaming are women over 50. Now, I learned that quite a while ago, but it's, it's a classic example for, you know, look for where the money is, look for where the social situation of, of your customer supports your, your business idea. That's how you want to handle it. Look at ton, uh, target groups that not everybody is, is targeting. Try to soothe a strong and recurring pain. That is also something that, that many people forget that, you know, like a problem needs to come and return every week or maybe even two or three times a week in order to allow you to build a business on it. 
that in, a problem exists one time in your life or one time every couple of years is probably not enough, not sustainable enough for you to build a business on. Um, and then, you know, this is also about creating value for yourself and others. That is also something that first-time founders often overlook. You can only pull this through if you convince a group of people, your coworkers, your investors, but also your customers to a certain extent, that it will pay, that it will deliver a tangible benefit to support you, to be part of your endeavor as a customer, as a partner, as an investor, et cetera. So looking for stuff that quite cliche-ish yeah, makes you rich and will eventually give you that yacht, uh, you know, with an electric motor, of course, uh, the sustainable yacht in the in the harbor of Saint Tropez. That is no bad thing. That is what also what many investors like myself, of course, want to see. And lastly, like if you're settling for the sustainability market, the big challenge that more and more people, thankfully, are, are finally getting is translating ecology, ecology problems into economic opportunity. Um, the moment that you don't complain about plastic pollution anymore, but rather say or recognize that the fight against plastic pollution today is already a $50 billion market or $100 billion or maybe $200 billion, I don't even know. But the problems that we're fighting are not just problems, they are the biggest economic opportunities of the next decades. And to do this translation work, you know, leaving out the yammering and the, the world is so terrible and we're all doomed, but rather say, well, these problems need to be solved. A lot of companies are already fighting it. This fight has already created a massive global market and we want our share in that market. That's the way to go. And, you know, typical uh, targets for these where like where you find these um, uh, uh, these characteristics are still industry productivity, old age when it comes to um, when it comes to target groups. I told you about Senovo, so they're working in that segment. Resources management um, in a sustainability way, but also still in industry processes, uh, AI, AI and automation, interpreting the growing amount of data that we have out there, and enabling technology. Technology that either enables individuals to make more out of their resources like Airbnb, for example, is doing that, or that enables industries to, to act differently. Those are still like five areas in which it is possible and necessary to found startups uh, and, and where there's an option to ground these startups in, in real world problems. Um, I'm going to kind of skip this, like, you know, concepts that I love. I mean, they reflect what, what I think are still good ideas in the past, but I'm just giving you a glimpse because I want to come to the end. I mentioned that Airbnb, you know, enabling individuals to better profit from their, you know, that's all about the enabling thing. Then Yovo, I mentioned enabling old citizens to, you know, easily make their homes uh, uh, livable again. A company of a friend of mine, Signavio, they make process management software, so they optimize processes and save the customers a lot of money. Uh, Move a car, I mentioned that too. They are targeting an unspectacular, yeah, this is highly nerdy. Yeah? I didn't know anything about how vehicles in Germany are being moved around between car rental offices, but it's happening on a massive scale. They told me about this. It's super boring, but that's what makes, makes it so, so good, I think, as, a, as an investment object. Trade Republic has enabled me last year for the first time to buy my first chairs. So uh, naturally I'm a fan, they make it really easy um, and everything with cannabis. I'm a big believer in the future of, uh, of weed. Yeah? And uh, it's, you know, it's been out there for a while. The first startups are getting out there. There's still a lot of regulation, but once this is properly kicked off, uh, uh, people are going to massive, be massively rich, yeah? everything with cannabis. Misconceptions on the other side, Höhle der Löwen does not depict founder and investment reality. So as a founder, it's best to not watch this at all. And if you watch it, then like watch it as a comedy show, right? That's that's the best attitude to, to deal with that. Rocket Internet and Zamba Brothers, they are not startups. Yeah? They have been organizations that were massively funded and that, that basically uh, created products, copied products the same way as Volkswagen is, is creating cars. So they're taking out the risk. They have all the resources that you don't have. So, so don't live after them. Agencies, consultancies, or selling self-made knitted scarves are not startups. I'm not saying that you shouldn't sell knitted scarves. It's just that other rules apply to you if you settle for one of these, you know, handmade or you know, trade startups than, than for startups. And that is that is good. Yeah? No one is interested in your idea and nobody's out to steal it, which means go out there, talk as much as you can. 
uh, don't hide. There's still a lot of people that, that are meeting who say, well, can I really be open? Should I tell others about my idea? Or you know, doesn't that mean giving it away to others who then might execute on that? No, it doesn't. Yeah. Always be as open as you can. And sadly, and, and I have been there too, huh? it's likely that a startup will make you poorer, not richer than your peers, at least for the first couple of years. You know, so be prepared for a situation where your parents will constantly tell you about the son of the neighbor's family who has now already attained status in his large corporation while you are still living off the 1,500 euros that some obscure accelerator program pays you. Yeah? You know, you're, you're like in your early 30s, shouldn't you be making more? Why are you following this up with? So that's that's going to be there. Yeah, like if you become rich, it's going to take time. Sadly, yeah. I've had hard times too. And again, Amazon shops, nutrition pills, vegan nail polish, they're also aren't startups. They are much more like you know, classic shops like bakeries, like you know, um, opening a shoe store, which isn't bad, but uh, it, it runs after different principles. So that's it. That's what I prepared for you today. If this was useful, yeah, uh, I have like on my website, Christoph RDE, that's where I kind of collect and put everything together, like the methods I've developed, the pitch method called the pitch bridge, but also others yeah, that I've turned into teaching videos. They're all free. That's also where you find you know text that I'm writing or uh, interviews, uh, a link to my podcast. Uh, you're all invited. I would even say obliged to connect with me on LinkedIn so that you can like ping me if there's specific um questions that you have opportunities that you want to create um and lastly there's my meetup uh that uh, i'm still running on a monthly basis it's called christoph's feedback it's still online uh, like i used to do this like estefania i used to do this offline in the heart of berlin and in other cities next up is i think on the 6th 10th or 12th of october Check it out, Christoph's feedback on Meetup. I would like to, you know, get into touch with you, like give you the chance to pitch your ideas, tell you why they will not be working. Um, and, uh, you know, keep that conversation flowing. And of course, be like Estefania. If you have the chance, share with others what you know, uh, enable others with uh, what, you're, what you're good at, uh, because that's like what makes this whole industry so great and so much fun and so uh, intellectually challenging too uh, to be in. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. It was very intense. It's a lot of information in a few minutes. It was great. I'm sure many people want to continue with the conversation. And that's why I share the links on the chat also together with Michael, who is there in the back. Uh, back up. And uh, we are ready for the 